Jim. So yes, I'm going to talk about a technique called holographic optical trapping. Um, I think it's uh, very, you know, personally, I think it's uh, kind of opens up a new world of uh, scientific inquiry, and I also think that it happens to be a really neat scientific concept itself. Um, kind of, I, I liken it to the development of the microscope uh, hundreds of years ago. You know, it enabled people to, for the first time, see things on a very small, uh, microscopic to be precise, uh, size scale. And what holographic trapping allows is you to actually manipulate things on very small size scales. Um, so all of the videos you're going to see are ones that I recorded while working for a company called Eryx uh, that uh, does this sort of thing. And because of that I can vouch that few people in the world have seen um, really any of these in particular and few people have also been able to use the technique. So I'm very excited to be able to uh, tell you all about it. Now I'm going to rush through the technical stuff and I'm not even going to mention applications because just the basics is as much as I have time for here. We shall begin with um, the, a basic optical trap which you might have heard of under the name optical tweezers. And um, basically we have three principles you want to keep in mind for this. Principle number one, light has momentum and it has momentum in a particular direction. Even though light doesn't have mass, it still has this momentum, okay? Principle number two is that when light passes through an object, if it hits that object at an angle, the light's going to bend. You know, you can picture light passing through a lens. And when the light bends, its momentum is also changing direction. Principle one, then, light has momentum. Principle two, when light passes through an object, the momentum changes direction. Principle three, and this is the key, is that once uh, the momentum, momentum has changed direction in one way, um, because of a principle called conservation of momentum, something else has to get momentum in the opposite direction. And that something else is the object that the light passes through. So, to put this kind of in a, a more visual perspective, You'll see on the left you have a uh, picture of a broad beam of laser light and it's passing through a lens and focusing to a very sharp point. And now picture an object that you see there directly at the center of that uh, laser focus. Now, at the moment the light is all passing through the object and it's going, it's all hitting the object perpendicular to the edge of the object, which means that it just passes right on through. Uh, none of that light is actually being bent within the object. And the object's very happy, it's not got any momentum transferring going on. The object likes to stay where it is. What happens in the other three pictures here is that the object is slightly off-center from that laser focus. And what happens there is that it's got momentum kind of coming in from one side, not as much on the other side. It's got a lot of different things happening to it, and it makes it very unhappy, basically. So the object really wants to get back to the center of that laser focus. And so that's exactly what it'll do. It gets a momentum that overall pushes it back to the center of the laser focus. And the useful part here is that as you move the laser focus, the object itself has to move along with it. So move the laser and you can move the object itself. Now what kind of objects are we talking about here? We're talking about basically objects in the middle two-thirds of this chart. And, you know, that generally includes things like bacteria, animal cells, and some of the larger viruses. Uh, you'd be talking about a range from about maybe 200 nanometers to about 70 micrometers. You can, uh, up at about 100 micrometers, you're getting into the diameter of a human hair. And if you try to move anything of that size, it can be a very difficult thing to do. Um, likewise with the very bottom end of the size scale. So this is approximately what we're looking for in terms of our object size. Now, in order to make multiple of these uh, optical traps, which is the real invention um, that you know my company didn't make, but it was made uh, back in the late 90s, the practical way to make something like this happen relies on a little device called a spatial light modulator. And you'll see it on the left side there. 
What it is is a very small liquid crystal display, just like in your mobile phone or in uh, that computer monitor right there. And it's just a little different from a regular LCD in that instead of creating an image that you can just look at, it creates a hologram. And we're all somewhat familiar with holograms. Um, the utility of a hologram for this purpose is that a hologram will allow you to take a single laser beam and split it into many different laser beams. And you can also adjust the characteristics of each of those lasers, uh, laser beams coming out of it. So that's the key part of the, uh, of the physical equipment. And what you'll see in that diagram is how you actually set this up on a microscope. You have a laser uh, that's spread out rather wide, reflecting off the spatial light modulator, then going through a series of optics, and as it's inserted into the optical train of a microscope, uh, the laser is now many different beams, and it's all focused down into the microscope sample that you, uh, that you see above the microscope lens there. Now, the microscope sample is going to contain that stuff that we just looked at in the other slide, your bacteria, cells, large viruses, other things on that size scale. This is the physical setup. The software side of things is equally important. What the software side of things does, you take a bunch of objects, right now we're looking at two micrometer glass beads, and so these are about one fiftieth the diameter of a human hair. And what you do, you can point and click, and what that will do is calculate a hologram that will split the laser appropriately into the different beams corresponding with the locations that you're trying to uh, select. Again, we're looking at a microscope sample here, so what you're seeing are objects manipulated in real time, and they're being held by nothing but light. And as you're moving them, what you're effectively doing is creating an animation of different holograms, and each hologram has all these beams located at different locations in space. Now that's two-dimensional manipulation there. But the technique is a three-dimensional technique. And where the third dimension comes in, you basically, for a given one of your optical traps, create a lens hologram on top of it. And that lens allows that optical trap to move up and down instead of just left and right. So you'll see the lower left object there is moved out of focus, which means it's actually going up and it's moved directly over another object. So now we've got three-dimensional movement here. These are just six objects, and you might ask how many objects can one actually move at once. So the next example is 121 separate ob object objects simultaneously. And the actual limit is not based on much more than the laser power. It's a little complicated, but you can basically create as many different beams as you want. So, again, the same types of object, two micrometer glass beads, all being held away from any surface and uh, moved simultaneously. In terms of size, these are the sweet spot. These are right in the middle of that uh, size spectrum that I showed on the, other, on the other chart. If you want to see where the ends of the spectra really are, this is about the most difficult thing, um, at least that I, I ever attempted to manipulate. And this is a, an HIV virion. So it's about 130 nanometers. You can imagine, you know, moving this over to a cell, trying to infect it. A lot of different things at this uh, size scale open up when you have this ability. The uh, real challenge is that they bounce around very quickly at the size. Um, they don't, well, naturally, I should not. That's fluorescently died. Um, that would be really creepy if they just naturally glowed. <laughs> <to it. laughs> but that's the low end of the spectrum, and that's not the fanciest manipulation. It's pretty difficult to do anything at that size scale. On the upper end of the spectrum, these are epithelial cells. So these are what you'll get if you scrape your, the inside of your cheek with a Q-tip. Um, they're about 60 micrometers or so. And although they're very difficult to move, you do see that you can gradually move them apart. And again, you're moving them with just light as with everything else here. So that's about the upper range. 
but there's a lot of room in that range for all sorts of different biological objects. And these are one of them. Um, these are bacteria. And one of the things that I like is we're actually manipulating live objects here. Um, this doesn't prove that they stay alive, but you'll, you can take my word for it that if you choose your laser color, your laser wavelength appropriately, then you can manipulate objects while keeping them alive. If you want to hit a red blood cell with a green laser, red absorbing green, that will be a very big disaster. But if you want to manipulate things like uh, bacteria, um, and if you manipulate with infrared light, for example, um, it works pretty well. And you can see at the end of that video, the optical traps are all turned off simultaneously. And you can see the bacteria all then kind of start dispersing around, going on their merry way. And they also happen to no longer align. So that's one of the things you can do with the optical traps. You can align them. And you can do more than just on end. You can do uh, rotations of various sorts. I should note, um, all you know, all the stuff uh, we did at Eric's was, you know, not just myself, but many various colleagues within and outside of the company. I'd like to acknowledge them, and also note that all the videos you see here are owned by Humanetics, which also owns Eric's and all the related stuff. This is something I find interesting. It's not just manipulation of solid objects. You're also able to manipulate liquids within other liquids. And these are specifically uh, immiscible liquids. So you've got you know, oil in ethanol, uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic to be technical. And what you can do is move around droplets of liquids just like you can move around the bacteria we saw before. And if you move two droplets together, you can actually mix them. Now, this is something I haven't honestly looked into how much has been done with extremely micro-scale mixing, but you're talking about, I'd say your lower limit would be manipulating droplets that are a millionth of a billionth of a liter in volume. So the ability to do incredibly small-scale uh, chemical work is uh, one thing that needs to be explored with the technology. Another thing that can be done is that you can create an interesting kind of optical trap called an optical vortex. And an optical vortex is not a changing animation. It's actually just a single hologram, but the way you design it, it can impart angular momentum onto the objects that it hits. And angular momentum will make the objects rotate. So what you see here, you're actually you're not adjusting the laser power, which would be an easy way to increase or decrease how fast something's rotating. You're actually changing characteristics of the light itself. And the effect it has is that you can adjust the speed and you can adjust the direction of rotation. Uh, so you can imagine, for example, a lot of little, uh, little gears on the micro scale and controlling them using just light as your energy source and controlling the direction of the gears, things like that. And then finally, um, when you're going to an actual application of, uh, of this technology, which again, I haven't really gotten into, you need some basics on hand. And one of the basics is that you don't want someone just sitting over a machine and personally manipulating everything slowly in real time. You want some actual automated processing. So the only thing that we've told the computer here is that you're going to have some number of objects on the screen and we'd like to put them in this end path. And so at the beginning you're seeing it actually identify with image processing everything that it can find on there and it automatically traps them all and then it automatically calculates all these different paths for the objects to move along into this final shape which happened to be the uh, logo for the company. <laughs> What a coincidence, the name <laughs> earlier and now the logo. Um, so this is kind of half of what you do for automated processing of objects. The other half is uh, microfluidics because you need to get stuff in and out, but that's outside the scope of this talk. And with that, um, ready for questions, please.